The last thing in chapter 7 in the PowerPoint is a little bit about the vectors. What a vector is, is it's a dynamic data type, meaning it grows and it shrinks in order to hold all the items. When you create an array of 10 elements, it's fixed in length. You can put 10 pieces in there, but if you want to put an 11th piece of data in there, you're in trouble. You'd have to allocate a new array, copy all the elements of the old array into the new one, and then put your new piece of data there at the end. Or if you wanted to insert in the middle of an array, it's a real problem. Because even if it wasn't filled, you'd have to copy all the data one up in order to get it to work and then put it into the middle. And the people at home aren't going to be able to see what I'm drawing, and there's no guarantee that this is going to happen. And they'll be to draw anyways, but if you had an array of four items, one, two, three, four, you copy some data into it, one, two, and three, and then you decide that you really wish that you could, let's say it was even five, five elements long, that we could insert a new value between that one and that one. What you would first have to do is copy the four into that one. You'd have to copy the three into that one, and then you'd have a blank spot in the middle in which you could put a value. 2.5 or whatever. And then if you wanted to delete this one, you'd have to copy that value into it, 2.5, you'd have to copy that value into the third one, you'd have to copy that four into that one, and so on. You have to do a whole bunch of monkeying in order to insert into the middle of an array, remove from the middle of an array, append past the end. If you append past the end, you have to grow the array and then copy all the elements. It's a real pain. So arrays are fixed in length. If you use Java, you're from maybe, maybe familiar with the idea of an array list. An array list is like an array, but you can add elements to it with the dot add method. Python lists are far more flexible. They're not fixed in length. If you want to create a list and then add three elements to it, it's real easy to do. So you do this. You have a list of numbers in Python. And then you feel like adding a few more. L dot append. Okay, I want my next number to be a 10. I want the next one to be a 20. I want the next one to be a 30. And then when you printed it out, you would see 9, 4, 3, 10, 20, 30. And that's Python. C does not come with a built in data type like a list or an array list. However, the C library, the C++ library function, um, library class vector does implement a list, list functionality where you can add items to the end, you can insert them into the beginning, I mean into the middle of the beginning, you can remove elements from it. And so it's far more flexible, far more flexible than the standard array R. Python doesn't even have an array type, they just implemented lists. Java went ahead and implemented the array type, but then they implemented array lists and a whole bunch of other container types on top of it. Python just took that one step further and said we're not going to even do arrays. They're too limited. So I snag a PowerPoint over vectors. I'll upload it for you all. I hope it's, I got the right one. So C++ provides several containers for storing and processing sequences of values of the same type. There are arrays, and then there's something called a val array, which I'm not familiar with, and then there are vectors. Vectors are part of what's known as the standard template library. Typically what happens is that people come up with something really useful and then it gets standardized and then published as part of the C standard. It's not like when C++ was invented that vectors were already a part of it. So we know how to do C arrays. I'm going to skip those. So vectors have predefined operations that can grow when necessary. And it says, but they don't shrink. And eh, well, that's okay. Even growing automatically is nice. And the elements can be of any type. This is looking like not the right PowerPoint. All right, phooey, that's not the right PowerPoint. So we're just going to look at the one that came with the book. The way you create a vector, just think of the word vector as meaning list, is you use that keyword, vector, and then in angle braces, you give the data type 
then you give it a variable name, and you can initialize it. Or you don't give it an initialize a list, and it's just vector followed by the data type followed by the variable name. Let's play with that. Let's go ahead and make a C++ file that's going to play with vectors. created a project of the wrong type. Should have been an empty project. And the usual boilerplate. been declaring all of our uh, functions as void rather than int in our boilerplate. I've always done int main or did I do void? Last time you did void and then you like All right. Okay. Sorry about that. I just walked out of my C class. All right. So we want to create a vector. going to pound sign include the vector library. So we're going to add pound sign include vector. And if we have that using namespace, we'll be able to leave off the SDD colon colon business. So pound sign include vector using namespace SDD. Okay, so let's make a vector. Oh, and let's do pound sign include string too. Pound sign include string. So I want a vector of ints. I'm just going to call it nums. I want a vector of strings. I'm going to call it words. So let's make one more vector of ints called num4. And we're going to say that we want it filled with four numbers that are equal to 100. So after that, it should be filled with 100, 100, 100, 100. going to want to put some values into our number, our nums vector. And so the textbook claims that you do that with pushback. I'm not sure if that 4 comma 100 is accurate. I think that I, I goofed that one up based on this. There's a difference between what this is telling me and what the textbook is telling me. When we print them out, that'll tell us. So anyways, let's add some numbers to our nums list. Nums dot 
push back. I'm going to add the number 3 to it. And I'm just going to copy and paste that so I don't have to keep typing it. Nums.push underscore back 5, 7, and 9. Now let's write a loop that will print out nums. And then I want to print out num4 just to see if it prints out a 4 comma 100, which is what I expect it to do, or whether it prints out 100, 100, 100, 100, which is what that page said it would. Should just go with what's on our PowerPoint. So for int v for value, colon nums, c out, arrow, arrow, v, arrow, arrow, and d out. And to do the same thing for the num4 array. 4 int v colon num4. C out, arrow, arrow, v. Arrow, arrow, e, and d, l. So we should see it say 3, 5, 7, 9, and then we'll see the mystery contents of the num4 vector. Well, what do you know? 100, 100, 100, 100, which is what the page said, which would indicate that the PowerPoint is not correct on it. Interesting. I'm going to want to go with another example from the PowerPoint just to see. See here where it says nums, and then our PowerPoint says that you can specify a whole series of numbers like that. Oh, that's an angle brace, not a, not a parenthesis. Okay. That would be the difference. If we wanted to, we could fill our array up, our vector up, with something like this. Kind of like we were doing when we did arrays. Except the textbook's indicating that we leave off the equal sign. See how accurate that is? Well, I didn't print them out. How would I know? Write a for loop that'll print the words out. Same way, except it's not going to be an int, it's going to be a string. So, for string v colon words. C out, arrow, arrow, v, arrow, arrow, e, and v out. And we should see our words there. Red, green, and blue. And accordingly, if we replace these parentheses with curly braces, it's rather than seeing the number 100 repeated four times, we would see a 4 and a 100. Interesting nomenclature difference. I don't know any way of doing that in Python. Excuse me, in Java. In Python, it wouldn't be too hard. Okay, so anyways. Let's, uh, I'm just going to copy these things, paste them into here so that I have some notes to look at later. So this would make the array contain 4 comma 100, whereas if we'd initialized them with parentheses, we would see 100 comma 100 comma 100 comma 100. All right, so what could we do with this? Anything that we could do with arrays. We could ask a user for a series of, you know, test scores, temperatures, something we want to average, something we want to sum up, that kind of thing. We might want to see if something is in the vector, check for its presence in the, in the vector. Is the word green in the list? If it is, I'd like to change the word green to orange, something like that. So you use the pushback member function to add something. It's the same thing as dot append for a Python list. You use the size member function to determine the size of it. So if we wanted to find out how many numbers were in our list, we would do nums.size or something to that effect. We have added four numbers to nums. Let's find out how many there are. C out nums size is input arrow arrow nums dot size 
parentheses, end parentheses, and the output. And it should say four, because we've added four elements to nub size at that point. Let's prove it. All right, yeah, nub size is four. Yes, sir. When you originally did the four root for the num four, um, I missed that. I missed that part because it gave me a problem with my arrows. Scroll down a little bit more. Yeah. Okay, right there under the, the num four, that very first set of ar arrows is telling me that uh, no operator could find a uh, case of right line line of type. Right? Oh, really? Let me come look. Let me come look. So along with push back, we can do other things. Let's find out what. Um, let's get a list of all the available methods for us. I'm just going to type nums dot, and we're going to see a whole bunch of different things. A whole bunch of them. Insert sounds interesting. So why don't I look up how to do nums dot insert? I'm probably going to wind up specifying the position I want it to go into, followed by the number. So I'm going to insert the number negative 999 into position 0. And I'm already getting an error. OK. So that didn't work. We really do not have much documentation on vectors. I have skipped them in previous classes. So if you want to remove the last element, you use pop back. That would delete the first, the last element of it. Now to me, that's not that useful, but this is assuming that you're using a vector as what's known as a stack. A stack is a data structure where you put things on so that the last thing that you added is the only thing you can see. And then if you want to get to other things underneath it, you have to pop them off. So it's what's known as last in, first out. The stack is just like a stack of papers. I put a piece down, a piece down, a piece down, a piece down, a piece down. Now all I can see is the last one, but if I want to see what's underneath it, I pop, and then I pop, and I pop, and I get all the way down to the beginning. So the last thing I added is the first thing I see, and the first thing I added is the last thing I see. And so the commands that they're giving us, this push back and pop back, turn our vector into what's known as a stack. See how to do a vector insert. Maybe we won't. To get it to work, you use something that's known as an iterator. We declare an iterator, we set it equal to the beginning of the thread to the uh, beginning of the vector, and then we call dot insert. I'm going to try something, and then if it doesn't work, I'm just going to skip this topic about inserting to our vectors. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call nums.insert, and then I'm going to pass in nums.begin as the position where I want to insert. Let's see if it works. So nums.insert, parenthesis, nums.begin, comma, and I wanted to add in a negative 9999. Now I need a for loop to print it out again. For int v colon nums, in parenthesis, c out, arrow, arrow, v, arrow, arrow, That'll make it look nice and make the code look pretty by adding our traditional curly braces and all that stuff. We'll leave that alone. There we build errors. 
didn't like that line. I'm sure that that's what it is. I'm not going to wrestle with it. I didn't have the parentheses. Yeah, that was dumb. I needed those parentheses there. Good, I was frustrated by that not working. Thank you. Okay, and so this time when I printed it out, negative 999 was at the beginning of the list. So we know how to append something to the end. You append something to the end with pushback. This is how you insert something into the beginning. If you want to insert into the middle of it, then you have to uh, use an iterator and you have to figure out, you have to find which element that you're, you're going to insert prior to. So nums dot push underscore back. 100 would put that 100 on it and then doing that insert there and when we were done this is what our list would look like what our vector would look like let's go ahead and push the second number onto it so it's absolutely clear 100 and then 200 so when we did that you would see 99 negative 999 100 200 if you want to wipe out your list, you call nums.clear. If you want to see if your list is empty, you call nums.size, and you can check to see if the size is equal to zero. I believe they show another way as well. Yeah, dot empty. Dot empty would do the same thing. So, if her num.empty returns true if num has no items, num.size returns the length of the vector. You can access them as though they were array elements, and this is something you can't quite do in Java. C++ lets you do what's known as operator overloading. Operator overloading is where you can take a class and you can add, well, we're going to have to cover classes before we talk about operator overloading. So anyways, let's say that, let's find out just what the second color is. If we have an array of element 3 and we want the second element, what's our index going to be? Don't say 2. <laughs> it's going to be 1, right? Okay, so C out colors subscript 1. Except it wasn't called colors, it was called words. I just happened to put some colors in it. And that's going to print out green because I set my words equal to red, green, and blue. That's the same nomenclature as arrays were. Let's see if we can change an element in the same way. Let's change that second, el that third one, the one at index two, to the word silver. And let's just change the same one. It did not like that. It does not want us to try to assign it. Well, I don't know why I'm doing, doing C out there. Now if I printed out the list, it should say red, silver, blue. So for string v colon words, C out arrow arrow v arrow arrow ndl. The array did contain green, red, green, blue, but then I changed that element green to silver, red, silver, blue.
to it. So to access an element or change an element, you use array syntax. See out num subscript i would print out a specific element. Num subscript 2 is equal to orange. That would change the third element in that vector to orange. That's as far as we are taking it. To me, arrays, vectors as not, are not as user-friendly as Python lists and Java array lists. I think we owe it to ourselves to use them just a little bit more, but then let's stop. Okay, so we've been mucking with adding these data to arrays, just you know, programmatically hard-coding some values in. Let's do the usual business of where we ask the user for a series of numbers and we push them on to the array, on, onto the vector, and then we'll add them all up at the end. So let's create a new vector called scores. Vector, and it's going to be floating point numbers. So vector float or double, vector double scores. I'm just going to use a while true loop because that's the way my brain works. While true, let's ask the user for a score or negative one to quit. So C out, arrow, arrow, enter score, or minus one to quit, backslash n. We need to read that into value, in which case I did not need to define it outside of the loop. So I move that double value out, and then C I n arrow arrow value, and we need to make sure it's not equal to negative one. So if score is equal equal to negative one, we're going to break out of our loop. But it's not score; it's called value. If that's not the case, we're going to add it. But I don't even need an else because break would kick us out of the loop. So by definition, anything after that is part of an else. Scores dot push underscore back that value. Add that value to our list. That should not look too al um, alien. Let's write a loop that'll print out, that, that'll iterate through our scores. Let's use a ranged for loop. Could just be V again. But what if we want to get the total as well? You know, we declare a, uh, a variable named, you know, total and add them all up. Why don't we create some functions, one called total and one called average, that will take a vector full of doubles and return the total or the average. So I'm going to write them down here at the bottom, but then I guess I'm going to copy and paste them and move them up to the top once I'm done, or else I'm going to declare the prototypes up at the top. So I'm going to create something called V total, short for vector total, which takes a vector of doubles. Oh, I'm just 
just going to call it data. My brain faltered. Okay. And so we need to declare our accumulator, and then we need to iterate through the list, adding them all to the accumulator, and then we will return the accumulator. So let's declare a variable called total, set it equal to zero. And let's use a, a range-based for loop. For about, um, double d colon data total plus equals I've been I was using v earlier for all my range based loops so I could make that v and v there but remember that variable names are meaningless to the computer we can call them anything we want to we can call it score and then change that one to score v for value d for double whatever I'm going to make it v just like my all my other examples were so for double v colon data total plus equals v And let's return that total. Now the average is just going to be invoking the total and then dividing it by the size of the vector. So double V A V G for or V average. How do you spell average? average, stick a V in front of it, V average, and it's going to take the same kind of vector, vector, angle, double, end angle, data, and we're going to return the, t the V total parentheses data divided by data dot size, the length of it. So now we have two functions that we could call on our scores after the user has entered them. Okay, so I'm going to go and put some calls to this stuff. But I'm going to do a little bit of editing to get the uh, spacing a little bit more condensed. I'm going to remove those braces. I'm going to move that one like that. Like that. All right. Now up here, this is the end of our loop after our while true loop and our break. I'm going to get the total. So double total equals V total scores. And double average equals the average of our scores. And we can print them out. C out total equals arrow arrow total. EVL. And C out arrow arrow average equals. End quote. Arrow arrow average. Arrow arrow EVL. Now we need to define prototypes up at the beginning or in a header file for these two functions or else we need to cut the functions and copy them. That's kind of lame. So I'm just going to take that function header right there, paste it, put a semicolon at the end of it. I'm going to take that function header, paste it, put a semicolon, and I'm going to cut those two things and paste them up at the top. But I'll do that after I make sure that everybody gets all the stuff that we've already typed in. You don't have to add prototypes. Just uh, make prototypes of those two functions and put them above main. I'm going to test run it, make sure that it works, and then I'll bring the code back up. Well, it didn't even compile, so obviously I have errors. V total not found. Oh, because I don't have my prototypes. Okay, I gotta add my prototypes. I'm gonna come up here to the top above main. I'm gonna add my prototypes. Double space v average parentheses vector angle double end angle data in parentheses semicolon and then double v total. Parentheses, vector, 
angle double and angle beta in parentheses. All right, so enter a score. 100, 90, 80, negative 1. The total is 270, and the average is 90. Could we have done that with arrays? Well, yes, but our we would have been limited to the number of items that have been allocated for the array. If we declared an array of length 10, we'd only be able to add 10 items. Here we could add hundreds. We could add thousands if we had the patience to type them all in. I have no idea what people are going to need to see because I know I scrolled up and down too much, so I'm just going to pause it here. So these are what our total, our prototypes are going to look like, just like that. So why would you ever want to use arrays if you had something like a vector available to you because arrays are fast, very, very, very fast. If you're using a standard template library, if you're using a library, it's going to be inherently slower than the direct memory access of an array. However, the simplicity and the flexibility that these things like vectors give you is quite often worth the additional little bit of processing time that it would take. So in general, I would not implement anything with arrays if I had an alternative, such as a list or a vector or an array list. Because we can see that it's so easy to create one. We can say how many items we wanted in it when we created it, just with the parentheses. We could say, I want a vector of four, you know. And then if you have a length, you, you have a structure of four elements, and you could access them just like arrays. But if you ever needed to insert into them after that, you could do so with a dot insert or with the pushback. And that's all they showed. Capacity. Dot capacity. Returns the maximum number of elements a vector can store without allocating more memory. Dot at. Returns the element at that position. So in, instead of using sub-square braces like that, you can use dot at. You have two syntaxes available to you. Let's print out our scores using the dot at rather than using the square braces. So above here, after we've calculated, after we've added all of our scores, but before we've done any calculations, let's print them out. C out scores colon space end quote semicolon and now let's have a little loop. We're going to start counting at zero and we're going to go up to the one minus the size. So for int i is equal to zero, i is less than scores dot size parentheses in parentheses i plus plus. And then C out scores dot at parentheses I in parentheses in parentheses space arrow arrow quote space quote. And then since we're not using ENDL anywhere, we need to use ENDL at the end of the loop. C out ENDL. That's just a different, that's, we've been using a range-based loops. The range-based loops just make things a little bit easier to write. This one could easily have been a range-based loop. Hopefully you know how you would write that at this point, if you wanted to do that. Maybe I'll ask you to comment that out and turn it into a range-based loop. Inner score. 200, 300, 400, negative 1. And it printed our scores, 200, 300, 400, and it printed out the total, and it printed out the average. I would like for you all to do that. 
if you know how, take this for loop, comment it out, and rewrite it as a range-based loop. We've got several examples for string v colon words. That was a range-based for loop for int colon v or for int v colon nums. That's a range-based for loop. And I'll give you the answer in a second. All right, it would look something like this. What is our data type? What is scores defined as? It's a, it's a vector of what? If I scroll up to where I declared it, what data type did I declare it? It's a vector of doubles. So for double D colon scores, C out, arrow, arrow, D, arrow, arrow, space. Quote, space, quote, like that. And then do a C out error E and DL on the next line so that we get a line break, a line feed at the very end of it. And if you had something else already in place, don't change it to mine. I've been using V everywhere else for you know as a value, double V colon score, C out V. The variable names don't matter as long as you, you as long as they make sense to the person reading the code. Did it work? All right, that worked. I think that's about enough about vectors. What's the takeaway? What do I want you to know how to do? How to declare a vector, how to append items to a vector, how do you do it with pushback, how to get the size of a vector, the length of it, we call dot size, to use a range for loop to print them out, which is just in general for int v colon, if it was an array, a list of v, I mean an array of ints, if it was a vector of ints, you make an int, whatever the type is, for type v colon in vector, then print out v. Or and how to access an element by index. Just like that. So how do we declare? You do it with its type like that. You give it a name. How to append items to it? V dot pushback. I keep trying to type a pin some items on it. How to get the size? See out v dot size. How to get a range for loop for and by the way we could I wrestled with what the data type was. I didn't actually wrestle with it. But I you know I asked you what it was and I went up here and I found out what the type of the vector was. If you use the word auto instead, it figures it out for you. I could do that for auto D colon scores, print D out. That's the absolute simplest form of a range-based loop to print something out. I was saying, I don't even know what type it was. You figure it out, Mr. Compiler, and it would do so. We could have been using auto everywhere in all of our range-based loops. Instead of a string, I could say auto. Because it is a vector of strings, that would work. Instead of int, I could have said auto. It is a vector full of ints. The compiler just fixes that. It replaces that word with whatever it is defined as. And words was defined as string, so the compiler, right when it was compiling, it would change it to string.
sense. That's about all we can squeak out of those three pages in the PowerPoint. All right, we're about ready to move on to new chapters. Uncharted territory. Okay, we're going to jump ahead in time. We're going to jump to chapter 8, classes. Procedural and object-oriented programming. We've been doing pretty much procedural programming. It focuses on the process of the actions that occur in a program. It focuses on the sequence of events. I'm going to need to declare some variables. I'm going to need to get some data in. I'm going to need to do some processing. And I'm going to be, need to display events. Object-oriented programming is based on the idea that you have data, and then you have things that happen to that data. So I have a patient object. And that patient has a name. And that patient has a birth date, and a city that they live in, and an address. And so you can create a person, a person, a patient, and then you can set their name, and you can set their address, and you can accept their, you can set their height and their weight. So, you know, we've written programs where we ask somebody for their height and for their weight, but we could create a class that contains their height and their weight. I think we've already done that. So objects are instances of ADTs that represent the data and its functions. Well, that's a funny term. Why don't we just Google that up, what an ADT is? Well, that's not useful. ADT programming. And it stands for abstract data type. In computer science. An abstract data type is a model for the data type, where you define data by its behavior from the point of view of the user of the data. You specify the possible values and then the possible operations on it. So you can get all computer science and start using words like axiomatic semantics and stuff like that, but we're not going to do that. What we're going to say is, is that an object is an instance of a class and that a class is a def well, we're going to say that a class is a definition that defines data and the actions and the, and the functions, the methods that act on that data. So that's key. Why don't we just say a class? is a definition that defines data and the methods that act on that data, and an object is an instance of that class. So I might make a class called fraction. And a fraction has got two pieces of data in it. I want them to be acceptable, uh, accessible to everybody, so I'm going to make them public, and so I'm going to define a top of the fraction and then a bottom of a fraction. And then I might make a function which allows us to set the fraction to two values. So public colon void set, and the way it's going to work is we're going to allow ourselves to set the top and set the bottom with one call. And it sets this dot top equal to the top parameter that was passed in as an argument there. And it sets this dot bottom equal to the bottom variable that was passed in as an argument to that parameter. And of course, we're just going to go turn around and actually type that into our code. But I wanted you to see it first. And then inside main, we would do something like this. Fraction f1. f1 dot set 1 tenth. That fraction is going to be 1 over 10. Fraction F2. 
f2 dot set, 2 over 3, 2 thirds, like that. So we have data and we have functions, which are known as methods. Methods are functions that are attached to data that act on it. Let's write one called invert that swaps the top and the bottom. So it needs to be public so that I can call it from everywhere. Void invert. It doesn't need any arguments because we're not passing in data. We're just saying, please swap your values. And so we need a temporary variable. Whenever you swap something, like that's kind of just a classic little programming question. You have two variables. Write code that will swap variables A and B. So you have to create a temporary variable and you set that equal to A. A is equal to B and then B is equal to your temp variable. Right. You can't just say A is equal to B and then B is equal to A because you're going to lose one of your values that way. So we're going to do that with our invert function. We're going to declare a temporary variable, int temp, and set it equal to the top. And then our top is going to be assigned the value that was stored in the bottom. And the bottom is going to be assigned the value that had previously been stored in the top. So to flip one, one, 1 over 2 to be 2 over 1. Let's actually code this now. I'm tempted to do this add new item and pick a class and run with it that way. Let's see what happens if we do. I'm almost afraid to do it this way. Add new item. see it. I can't pick class there, can I? I could do class wizard. We'll play with that after a while. All right, here's what we're going to do. Define your class. Class fraction. public colon. Everything is going to be public, so I'm just going to have the public keyword once rather than doing it once per every, uh, every variable as I was showing you in my notes. Int top, int bottom, now let's write our set function. Void set parentheses int top comma int bottom. And so this in my code example I, I use the period that's not accurate where you use um, dash greater than. That's different than Java, where you would type this dot. So this dash greater than top equals top. That looks a little silly, but what it's saying is that the variable named top that's part of this object is now equal to this variable top, which was actually passed in as a parameter, defined as a parameter. Bottom needs to be done the same way. So this hyphen greater than bottom equals bottom. This is called the this pointer. Anything that follows the this pointer has to be a member of the class so the syntax won't work. We couldn't do this dash arrow x because there's no x member. Well, what if I wanted to do this dash arrow x? I'd have to come and I'd have to add a new variable called x up here in space x or something like that. All right, now let's do our void, excuse me, our invert. It's going to be another void. It's not going to return anything. Void invert. It doesn't take any arguments. It doesn't have any parameters. But we are going to need that temporary variable I mentioned. So int temp is equal to this dash arrow. I'm just going to start calling it hyphen. 
even though it's more than a hyphen. This hyphen top and this hyphen top is equal to this hyphen bottom and this hyphen bottom equals temp. And everywhere I said hyphen, think dash greater than. And then lastly, we need a calculate function, which is just going to return top divided by bottom. double so that you know it better be a floating point type so double calculate parentheses in parentheses and what are we going to do we're going to return double parentheses in parentheses we're going to take the top and divide it by the box double parentheses bottom we're just casting those to doubles because they are ints right now, but we don't want to do integer division. We don't want any rounding down. We want to see the whole thing. We don't want to see zero. We want to see 0.333 or whatever. We don't want to see one, one when we could be seeing 1.2. All right, I'm going to do a little bit of condensing of space. my class, my fraction class, I'm going to come down in the first couple lines of main are going to actually use it. So fraction f1, f1.set, 1, comma 2, let's calculate that value and see out it. So c out F1 equals space in quote arrow arrow F1 dot calculate parentheses in parentheses. These are functions. A method is a function, so we always have to use the parentheses. Arrow arrow endl. Now let's invert it and then call calculate again. So after my C outline, I'm going to have F1 dot invert parentheses in parentheses. And then I'm going to do that C out again. So C out arrow arrow. Whoops, I haven't done the invert. F1 dot invert. And then I'm just going to copy and paste that C out line to save myself some time. Java programmer, here's a difference, not a big one, but in C++, you define your classes with a semicolon after the closing parentheses. In Java, you do not. So without that parentheses, it would be a semicolon, excuse me, without that semicolon, it would be a syntax error. Right, I'm going to run it, make sure it works. All right. So my fraction was 1 over 2, which evaluates as 0 0.5, but then we flipped it, we inverted it. And so 2 over 1 is 2. Let's add one more silly little function called print, which will print it in a silly English syntax, where it prints the number and then the word over and then the other number. So C out print. No, 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 why am I calling it C out? Void print, parentheses and parentheses. And then we're going to see out the top, see out top, arrow, arrow, space, quote, over, space, end quote, arrow, arrow, bottom.
And I guess above that, I want to describe what it is. So C out, arrow, arrow, fraction is space, end quote, like that. And then maybe a, a last line should just be C out, arrow, arrow, E and DL. And that could have been done all on one line. So above where I do my C outs, right there and there, I'm going to call f1.print, in parentheses, in parentheses. And the same after the call to invert, f1.print, parentheses, in parentheses. All right, so fraction is 1 over 2, which evaluated to 0 0.5. Fraction is 2 over 1, which evaluated to 2. So we've defined a class. A class is a collection of data and the functions, also known as methods, that act on that data. All righty. Why don't we pause? If you've got all this typed in, great. Otherwise, take a few minutes and I'll help you get it fixed. And let's plan on getting back at 840. All right, gang, I was an idiot and didn't record the next part of the lecture. Let me show it to you. What I did is I right-clicked and I added a sphere.h. So I did source files, add, new item. It was a header file. So I chose header file and typed in sphere.h. And here's the contents of sphere.h right here. So pause it and type that in. And then we added a sphere.cpp, the same way. Right click, add new item, make it a cpp file, make it sphere.cpp, and type this. No, not that. Where's my sphere.cpp code? Type that. So pause that and get that typed. Then compile your code. And when it compiles, then you'll make the last change. So if you're ready for that, go back to your main method. You're going to have to do something. First, you're going to have to do pound sign includes sphere.h with quotes around it up at the top. And this is in source.cpp where our main function is. Make sure you have that include there. And then scroll down here. And in main, these are the lines of code that you're going to add from there to there. So pause and get that. Pilot, run it. Okay, so this would be what went in the header file, the class rectangle.h. And then the definition of set width, set length, get width, get length, and get area could be broken out and put in a CPP file. Or we could define them in, in line with the rest of this. So access specifiers are used to control access to the members of the class. The code that creates the object, can it access that function? Or can it modify that data? Public means it can, those items can be accessed by functions outside of the class, by the code that created the object. Private means that they can only be called or accessed by functions within the class. So, they can be listed in any order. They can appear multiple times in a class. It's not like you have to put all your private things up at the top and then your public things underneath. That's just a common paradigm because you stick, you know, your private data up at the top and then you change to public and then all your functions that use that private data are listed underneath there. If not specified, the default is private. You don't have to do it line by line, but you can. So using const with member functions, one thing that you should do is for every function that's not going to change the data, you add the const keyword to it. And what that does 
is it says that it's a guarantee that that function does not change the value of that of the data. Of, excuse me. Okay. If you use the const keyword at the end of a function prototype like that, what it says is that this function does not change any of the data. We could do that. We could go back to our class. We could go to. Let's do it to our uh, our fraction class first. So where it says class fraction, does set change the data inside the fraction class? Does it modify the data? Just take a guess so I can say yes or no. Does it modify the data? Yes. That's the entire purpose of the sets function is to change the contents of top and bottom. How about invert? Does it change data? Yes. All right. How about calculate? No. It returns a calculation, but it doesn't change the value of the top and the bottom. So we can call that const. How about print? A print function shouldn't change the data, it should only display it. And by the way, um, folks who were uh, just watching this, not here, that's another change we made while the class was, while the recording was lost, is we added, we changed these to private. We made a private colon int top and int bottom, and then we changed to public. And then down here, we broke out the definition of print into its own. We separated the definition of it from the implementation. But print is a constant because, or it can be declared as constant because it doesn't change any of the data. So I can do that. Now, why would I do that? Well, I also need to make a const here, here as well. Why would I do that? Because if I have a const fraction, if it has been declared as a const, I better not be calling invert on it. That would change its data. I better not be calling set on it because that would change its data. I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to write some function that takes a fraction. I'm not sure what. And um, since I can't think of a creative purpose for it yet, I'm just going to call it test, test fraction. And so what does test fraction do? It takes a const fraction as its parameter. I'm just going to call it f1. I'm not sure what it's going to do with it, but I know some things that it can't do. It can't call f1.invert. Why? Because that fraction is supposed to be a constant. The compiler is stopping us from doing anything to f1 that could change. We said, oh, fraction's a constant. You better not let me change it. And here I am trying to change it. That won't work. But if I wanted to print it, that'd be okay. f1.print? Sure. Great. Why? Because print is defined as a function that is available for even if the data was declared constant. So that's what that const keyword means. It means that if the variable that I have, the object is a const, I could not call set on it, I could not call invert, but I could call calculate, and I could call print. A well-designed class will have its functions declared as const if they do not change the data. Let's go to sphere.h and see which ones of these could be declared as const. How about set radius? The set radius, is that supposed to change any data inside the object? Yes, it does change the data inside the object, so it would be declared as const. No. How about get radius? Does get radius modify any data? No, it just returns it. How about calc surface? Does it modify the value of the radius variable? Nah. How about calc volume? Same deal. It's just using the value. It's not changing it. Now, I've probably broken it because I would need to go and change the code in sphere.cpp to match. So I'd have to go to sphere.cpp and get radius is a const, calc surface is a const, and calc volume is a, is a const. Now that may seem nitpicky, but if you're, if you're developing a class, you ought to go ahead and do that so that you can support using const, constant objects, making something a, a const.
either as a parameter or if or just even as something that you define in your code, you know, const float. Because we could do that. It actually would not work in this case though. But in my main, I could come over here in main, and as soon as I create my fraction, I instead of being a sphere s1, I could do const sphere s1. But there's a problem with my code implementation. The problem is that I can't call set radius on it because the sphere is a constant. Well, how do I change that data? How do I change the radius? I would have to provide a method called a constructor so that when I created my sphere, I could specify the radius at the same time I was creating it. So obviously our code's not ready yet to be able to create constant spheres. So I'm going to delete that keyword. So defining a member function. When you define your member function, you put the prototype in the class declaration, but you prefix the function name with the class name followed by the colon colons, known as the scope resolution operator. So our prototype goes in the header file, and then the function implementation goes in a CPP file, probably of the same name as the header file, to be correct, to make it easy to find. But then you prefix the name of the function that whose code you're implementing, the method with the name of the class. And we did that. We've seen a couple examples of that now. So accessors and mutators. A mutator is a member function that stores something into the class, changes the value of a hidden variable in some way, a private variable. Whereas an accessor is one that retrieves a value. So mutators are the setters. If you have getters and setters, mutators are the setters, whereas accessors are the getters. If we have a private variable called radius, then we would implement a mutator called set radius, and we would provide an accessor called get radius. If we have a private variable called height, then we would provide get height and set height. Get height being the getter, so it's an accessor, and set height being a setter, so it's a mutator. And an accessor should, since it does not change the object's data, should be marked const. Defining an instance of a class. An instance of a class, I would call that declaring it. But it's defined like a structure variable, defined like any other variable. You give it a type name followed by a variable name. And then you access its members using the dot operator. Rectangle r, r dot set width. Set its width to 5.2. And then once you've set its width, you could call dot get width to print it back out. You get a compilation error if you try to access a private member using the dot. If it's private, then the uh, main code, the client code, cannot access it. I'm not going to make our eyes roll up by looking at pages upon pages of code from a PowerPoint. So avoiding stale data. Some data is a result of a calculation. Like the rectangle class could have a git perimeter and a git area, right? And the area is just a length times the width. You could try to store the area of it as a variable, but you wouldn't want to do that. The area is calculated. So if we were to use an area variable in the rectangle class, its value would be dependent upon the length and the width, meaning that any time one of those two things change, then area is no longer valid, right? You create a two by two rectangle and so its area is four, but then later on you call set width and change its width to three. Well, that area would no longer be valid. It's called stale, it's stale data. You avoid stale data by re not having those calculated variables and instead providing functions to calculate them. So to avoid stale data, it's best to calculate the value of the data rather than store it in a variable whenever possible. That's why get volume is a calculation rather than having a volume variable. An area is a calculation rather than having an area variable. So pointers to objects. Maybe we'll skip that because we haven't talked enough about pointers yet. Why have private members? 
provides data protection. It doesn't make your application more secure from hackers. It just makes it more secure to the programmer who's programming it. They make fewer mistakes if the data members are private. Data can only be accessed through public functions. And the public functions divide the class's public interface. So code outside the class can only access the public member functions to interact with it. If we have a rectangle class with set width and get width and set length and get width length, then the main function, the client code, can call those functions, but those pieces of data are hidden from it. If later on we decide that width and length should be floats rather than ints, or that they should be doubles rather than floats, we can make those changes and the calling code doesn't necessarily have to change. Separating specification from implementation. That's what we did with our sphere class. We specified it in the header file and we implemented it in the CPP file. So by the book, place your class declarations in a header file. If your class is called class name, make the header file classname.h. And then put your member function declarations in a CPP file. So if you have a rectangle.h, then your function should be defined in rectangle.cpp, and that file should pound sign include the header file. So programs that are going to use the class must include the header file and then be compiled and linked with the header file, with the CPP file. Now fortunately, Visual Studio makes all that pretty easy. You could create a new file, then it goes ahead and compiles and links it automatically. Automate, y'all do all this, some of this stuff by hand. It would require us going into the other room in order to, uh, to do this stuff. Inline member functions. That's different than splitting the implementation from the specification. This is how we did it for our fraction class. So you can define your member functions in line, inside the class de declaration, inside the class keyword, or after the class declaration. We did our fraction class with inline function declarations. We did our sphere class with after cl class declarations, separating them. And it says that the inline is appropriate for short function bodies. If you want to go ahead and define get width right there as you're defining your class rather than not tab over and add it to a CPP file, you could do that. So here's our inline class, or excuse me, here's our rectangle class. And we've decided that set width and set length are not to be implemented here. But for some reason, get width and get length and get area can be defined here. And I don't understand the book's thinking on this. It's not like set width and set length are any more complicated than get width and get length. But get width, we have defined in line as being returned width. And get length, we have defined right in the, in the definition as return length. But we only provided prototypes for these functions. So we'd better go to the CPP file and add code for them. So trade-offs. Why would you do inline functions versus regular function definitions where you separate them? Code for an inline function is copied into the program in place of the call, which makes your program larger but runs faster. Regular functions. When called, the compiler stores the return address of the call, allocates memory for the functions, etc. Ignoring performance concerns, it's easier to write everything as an inline function, right? You create your header file, you put everything in there, and then you don't need to create a CPP file that goes with it. It's just easier. It's easier to write that way. But there are performance considerations. The performance consideration is that inline functions run faster, but make your program larger. Memory-wise, the memory requirements are larger. Constructors. When I created my fraction, it sure would be nice if I could specify the top and the bottom while I was creating it rather than have to call a second set function. It'd be really, and to do that, you'd use it what's known as a constructor. 
A constructor is a member function that is automatically called when the object is created. Its purpose is to construct the object. The constructor's function is a class name, and it has no return type. So we've decided that we're going to create a constructor for the rectangle class, and it's just going to set some arbitrary values. Let's do that for our fraction class. Let's create a constructor for our, a constructor for our fraction class. So inside source.cpp, find your class definition for fraction, class fraction. And the first method in it is no longer going to be set. It's going to be fraction. Parentheses in parentheses. And I guess the world's easiest fraction would be where top is equal to 1 and bottom is equal to 1. So top equals 1, semicolon, bottom equals 1. So now we could create a constant fraction. We were able to create a fraction and have its top and its bottom set without calling a set function. But we might want a constructor that allows us to set those values different from just 1 over 1. We might want to modify our fraction constructor or provide a alternate, known as overloading it, provide one that accepts a top and a bottom. So fraction parentheses So the top of it's called the numerator, so I'm going to call it n. And the bottom of it's called the denominator, so I'm going to call it d. So int n, comma, int d. And inside the source code for that, I'm going to say top is equal to n and bottom is equal to d. Variable names are meaningless. I could make this int bottom and int top, you know. But then I would have to use the this keyword to reference them. There have been, I've been inconsistent. I have not been using the this reference, the this pointer throughout. There's only one time when you absolutely have to use the this reference, and that's if the parameter and the variable name are the same. So in our set function, where I did set top and bottom, my parameters had the same name as the members. So... I had to define, I had to use the this pointer in order to distinguish the data from the parameters. So if I call this int top and int bottom, which would be more correct, then I would need to use the this references. This dash top equals top, and this dash bottom equals bottom. Now when I create a fraction, I can specify its top and its bottom. See down here where I created one fraction, like that, fraction F1, and I set it equal to 1, 2, I can create a, another fraction. Fraction F2, and I can say, oh, I want this fraction to be 2 over 3, 2 thirds, like that. That's cooler than having to create the fraction and then set its values, especially if you had a whole bunch of values in it, right? Sure, the fraction only has 2, but what if it had 10 different possible values? It'd be nice to be able to set all 10 of them rather than create the object and then call 10 different set functions. thinking that it's going to be close to wrapping the class up at this point. But I do think that we need some homework based on the idea of classes. On the homework for 1D and 2D arrays, um, I didn't see any like uh, Word document uploaded to that one. That would be bad. That would
would make it difficult for you to do. Let's go to the one D and three D right once some sneaky peek figured out how to do it. Let's see. So in the homework document, you're correct. I don't see homework for number fourteen. Is it in the daily notes for that day? Yes. So we found it. Okay. I apologize for that. I apologize for not having that uploaded. So close. Okay. With that in mind, I'm not going to make this one horrendous because most of y'all weren't able to do this homework, and so we've been delayed. Please, guys, if you see a missing assignment, document, text me over it over the weekend or whatever, and I'll get it fixed. So the first one's going to be write a book class, define the variables to contain data about a book, what might we want to know, the title, the author, the publisher, the year, and then the pages. main code should create a book object and then set the title, author, publisher, year, and pages. This is a data only class. I didn't even ask you to add any functions for it. So really you can do that as a struct. But these are all going to be public members. All data members are public. Okay, so that's the first part of it, part one. Part two is going to be write a class called cone. It will have two private elements, height and radius, which you may as well make double. And then it's going to have a public member, public methods, functions, get volume, or count volume. That's yeah, use get. So you're going to need to provide getters and setters for the height and the radius.
and then get volume, which calculates the volume of the cone. Okay. I really wish. Somebody complain about that. All right. So does that make sense? You're going to have a book class that's going to have these as variables in it. Most of them are just going to be strings, pages of, in here could be numbers. And then part two, a cone class with a height and a radius, you're going to need getters and setters for them. I can fluff out the specification with what getters and setters look like for each one of them, but, but I think you could probably use the examples we already have. The setters are going to be set height and set radius. The getters are going to be get height and get radius. So, your main code should ask for the radius and the height. Create a cone object set the radius and the height, and print the volume. So we good? Good enough on that? After Wednesday, we'll have done more examples of classes. So even if you're not feeling totally comfy with it, then you certainly will be at that point. All righty, any questions? I see some head shaking now and some people pulling plugs out. Let's create a Dropbox and... And we'll be good to go.